next on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show. Here's Ryan O'Neill. And we're on the line today with uh, Alfred University history professor, uh, Dr. Gary Ostrower. Uh, Dr. Ostrower, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, everyone talking about the death of uh, State Trooper Nick Clark, a very popular uh, person locally, uh, an Alfred University uh, football player. What was that story you told me uh, on the phone about that other coach uh, praising uh, Nick Clark's football skills? The uh, Nick graduated from Alfred in 2011. And in the uh, football season of 2010, uh, Alfred had played uh, in the quarterfinals of the NCAA championship for Division Three schools, uh, Mount Union College, which is in Ohio, and which has been perennially, when I say perennially, for maybe 25 years, either the top Division Three school in the country or, uh, or the second uh, top school in the country. The coach of the uh, Mount Union team, uh, after Alfred played Mount Union in the quarterfinals of the NCAA tournament, uh, told our, uh, our own coach, Dave Murray at the time, uh, that Nick Clark was the best linebacker that Mount Union had faced all year long. And I don't have any reason to doubt that. He was an outstanding athlete. I did not know him personally. He had never taken a course from me, uh, but I certainly had seen him on the football field for many, many, uh, uh, you know, for the four years that he was here. Uh, his mother, uh, Teresa Gunn, uh, is a, a very fine professor of accounting at Alfred. Uh, so there's a sense in which it's family. You know, I think that we all feel very, very aggrieved, very lost, very, very sad about his about his uh, about his death. The um, the uh, t- tomorrow will be the Fourth uh, of July, uh, and we often talk about history when we have uh, Dr. Ostrauer on. Uh, Dr. Ostrauer, uh, the Declaration of Independence, can we talk about that? I'm happy to do so. The Declaration, we all know what the Declaration is. It, in a very literal sense, did declare American independence from Great Britain. Uh, it is dated July 4th of 1776. Uh, but there are things that we don't always uh, know about, uh, things that we think we know about. Uh, so there are a couple of things that I would mention about the Declaration that might be of interest to our listeners. For one thing, American independence was declared not on July 4, 1776, but on July 7th, on July 2nd of that year. Uh, why July 2nd? Because it was at the Second Con- uh, Continental Congress uh, that the delegates, there were 55 delegates, uh, that the delegates uh, declared American independence. They passed a resolution based on a proposal that had made been made about a, a month earlier by a fellow named uh, Richard Henry uh, Lee from Virginia, uh, that the United States separate from uh, Great Britain, that the U- that these uh, colonies are and ought to be, is the way uh, Lee had phrased it, uh, free, independent. Uh, there were, a committee was then set up of five people, including Jefferson, to draft a declaration. But the formal vote for independence came on the 2nd of July. On the 4th of July, the, uh, the resolution itself was pr- proposed as a, uh, as a formal declaration that we know uh, to the delegates, and they started to sign it on that day. By the same token, they didn't all sign it on that day. It actually took about uh, three or four months before all the delegates, all 55 of them, uh, had signed. And that was because back in that period, uh, we didn't have interstate highways. We didn't have jet transportation. Uh, so people had to come from homes, from their estates in Georgia and South Carolina and Massachusetts and so forth. Uh, so it really took quite some time before all 55 uh, of the signers had actually, uh, had actually signed. Uh, in either case, uh, independence became real as a result of that, uh, that declaration of not just the written declaration, but the resolution passed by uh, the Continental Congress on July 2nd. Um, you know, not to get uh, too off the historical importance, but I, I did want to um, 
ask you something about that. You know, John Hancock, you often will hear people say, let me give you my John Hancock when they're going to sign something. Why do people say that? Hancock's signature was a little bit bigger? Well, it was a little bit bigger, and when he was asked why, and we don't know whether this is a true story or apocryphal, uh, but, uh, you know, allegedly, the legend is that uh, he said, uh, I've signed it this way so that King George III can see it without using his spectacles. Yeah, it was a good deal uh, bigger, his signature, than anyone else's. Uh, and so that's, you know, one of the funny little stories, as I say. My hunch is that it's really not true. But in either case... Uh, it's part of the Declaration lore. But there are a couple things about the Declaration that I think are worth uh, thinking about. Uh, number one, we all refer to the Declaration of Independence. We all think that we know what it is. How many people, how many Americans today, about 330 million of us, how many have actually read the Declaration of Independence? And my hunch is that, you know, maybe 10% have done so. And when you read it, and when you read it carefully, you learn things about the nature of politics back in the 18th century. The Declaration begins with the following words. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another. Okay, it says, when in the course of human events. It doesn't say when in the course of the events of, of the British Empire or of Great Britain or of the American colonies. It talks about human events. And the reason is that Jefferson and the other founding fathers wanted to universalize what they were going to say here. They were putting it into a truly global context. They understood that the United States was not fully isolated, that we were part of an international community, something which I think the current president of the White House has not fully uh, absorbed. So, yeah, they talk about human events. And then he says it becomes necessary, not desirable, not that it would be nice, but it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands and to assume the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. And then he goes on to say something which equally is, I think, of real importance, historically at least of importance. He says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, for Jefferson, these truths, what he's going to say in the next paragraph, are so clear as if everyone, anyone can understand them. You don't have to be a philosopher. You don't have to be a political theorist. You don't have to be well-educated in order to understand these truths. And what are these truths? Number one, that all men are created equal. He doesn't say women. He says that all men are created equal. Now, this is written by a man who owned about 250 slaves. Jefferson never fully believed what he wrote there on one level. And yet on another level, okay, on an abstract level, on a philosophical level, he certainly did believe that. And that statement is going to reverberate through American history. It's going to help us understand why Abraham Lincoln is going to seek to free the slaves. It's going to understand why people like John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson are going to fully support the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And then he goes on to say that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And that among these rights, and when he says unalienable, he means they can't be removed from us. They can't be taken away from us. They can't be somehow denied, okay, that are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everyone thought, among those at least, that five, that committee, that he was going to say that among these are life, liberty, and property, that's what an English philosopher by the name of John Locke had once written. Jefferson changes that to the pursuit of happiness. And by happiness, he meant that we are going to live in a republic of virtue, that we're, going to, we're not going to lie to each other. We are not going to be selfish. We are going to be cooperative. That among these are that we have a right to life. Very, very few people in the 18th century thought we had a right to life. Jefferson did. That we have a right, right to liberty. Very few people accepted, very few people enjoyed liberty back in that period. But Jefferson felt that we should all, uh, that we should all enjoy it. So he's given us, in a sense, a theory of natural rights. And then in the very, very next sentence, he says, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. 
Okay? And not just that, that's why we have government, to protect these rights, to ensure these rights. But he says that these governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. It's a democratic principle. He builds a democratic principle right into the Declaration of Independence. And then there's a third uh, theory that he puts in, that he throws into this declaration. And it's the theory of revolution. He says that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, in other words, seeks to deny us our natural rights, seeks to deny us a government based on the consent of the government, then he says it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government. And that's, in a sense, what Jefferson and, of course, his colleagues were doing in July of 1776. They were creating that new government that presumably would ensure not only that all men are created equal, but that would ensure that we have a government based on that principle. Dr. Osborne, you talked about the civil rights issues um, in connection with the Declaration of Independence um, and the, the contradictions there. How common was slavery in Europe at the time uh that the Declaration of Independence was signed, and is Europe uh, and European slavery where the founders who went along with slavery got the idea? Well, <laughs> that's a complicated question, more complicated, I think, than most of us would think. Uh, there had been uh, slavery, of course, in the ancient world. The Greeks, who in a sense give us the basis for uh, democracy, uh, 10% of ancient Athens were slave. The Romans, Okay, who also, of course, are going to, in a sense, develop this democratic ideal, at least until the empire is formed after 44 B.C. Uh, they, too, had uh, a large slave population. But by the time we arrive at the Middle Ages, slavery more or less disappears in Europe. And it's not going to be reintroduced until the 15th century. When a Portuguese man of war brings back about, I think it was something like 15 slaves uh, to Europe. But th there weren't very many slaves in Europe per se. Where, where this becomes important is the European empires, initially with the Portuguese and the Spanish in Brazil and elsewhere in Latin America. But then increasingly, of course, almost every European country is going to become involved in the slave trade. And that certainly included England, it included Denmark. It included France, it included all of these countries. So in the colonies, regardless of where these colonies were, whether we're talking about India or we're talking about the Caribbean or, of course, our own 13 colonies, slavery existed, and slavery would continue until the 19th century. Now, when I say slavery existed, for instance, at the time of the Revolution, 1776, there were 13 colonies, 13 states that become the United States of America. Every single one of those states permitted slavery. However, in Massachusetts, the slave population was 2%. In New Jersey and Pennsylvania, the slave population was about 8 to 10%. But, of course, in the South, the slave population ranged from about 25% in Maryland to about 65% in South Carolina. So, you know, there are regional variations that are important. And I might add, by the way, that the majority, and I mean the majority of those people, of those men, who signed the Declaration, including that phrase, all men are created equal, the majority of them were slave owners. And I guess the other point I would make about uh, you know, this is that in the Declaration itself, you know, Jefferson was very conflicted about slavery. On one sense, he's saying that we are all entitled to freedom, that we are all entitled, you know, that we're all created equal, and yet, you know, he's a, uh, he's a large slave, hold, uh, slave owner himself. And so what he tries to do, because he did feel conflicted, he even felt somewhat guilty about it, he writes a paragraph in his draft, in one of the earlier drafts of the Declaration, in which he blames King George III, the English king, he blames King George III for slavery. Whereas, in fact, the British were in the process of, uh, of an anti-slave campaign. It was the Americans, at least in part, who were revolting in order to in order to preserve slavery. There was a fear here that the British would end the institution, and that became one of the factors, one of the main, many factors involved uh, in the American desire for independence from Great Britain in 1776. 
We always learn a lot when we have uh, Alfred University history professor Dr. Gary Ostrower on. We're going to take a quick break, check the forecast. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi, this is Justin from the Hornell Partners for Growth. Yeah, I just wanted to call in and let everybody know about the 4th of July festivities going on this Wednesday. We've got trade starting at noon, going our regular route down Main Street. And then from there, we have a car show at 1 o'clock down at the Veterans Memorial Park at James Street. And there will be vendors, festivities, things for kids to do, uh, lots of food trucks. And then there will be fireworks starting at dusk provided by the City of Hornell and the Hornell Partners for Growth. Checking in with meteorologist Rob Carroll and some uh, more warm temperatures as we get closer to the 4th of July, Brian. Uh, yesterday we had some heavy shower thunderstorm activity uh, traverse the area in the afternoon and evening as a little frontal system went through. That's now hung up from New England down through the southern part of the state into the mid-Atlantic region. It looks like we're under heat advisory once again for today. We'll be looking at lots of sunshine. We're going to be 85 to 90 later this afternoon. Any cloudiness will erode this morning. Ryan, sun came up this morning, 539. It'll set tonight at 850. We're clear to partly cloudy tonight, 65 to 70. For the fourth tomorrow, partly sunny, hot, humid, 90 to 95. There is the chance of a shower or a thunderstorm tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow night, partly cloudy with a risk of a shower or storm, 70 to 75. Clouds and some sunshine Thursday may be a shower or a thunderstorm. Highs Thursday, 85 to 90. And then, Brian, we break the heat wave Friday. We're sunny and more comfortable in the 70s. More of the same coming up for Saturday. And we're back with Alfred University uh, history professor, Dr. Gary Ostrower. Dr. Ostrower, uh, did you want to get into current events now? Uh, we have about five minutes left. Did you want to do current events, or did you want to keep talking about the uh, Declaration of Independence and the founders? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to current events, but let me mention a couple of other things about the Declaration, which I think is of, of some importance. For one, you know, we ought to ask the question, who are they writing this for? They had declared independence by resolution on July 2nd. The declaration that we know, that written declaration, appears on July 4th. So why bother? I mean, isn't this simply uh, kind of superfluous? Isn't this unnecessary? And the answer is because the Americans had an audience. That is to say, when I say the Americans, I'm talking about Jefferson and the Continental Congress had an audience. And by the way, if I can just backtrack one little bit, I keep talking about Jefferson. More than Jefferson, it was John Adams from Massachusetts, not Jefferson from Virginia, who was responsible for the uh, for the resolution on July 2nd. It was Adams who was more insistent on independence than even, uh, than even Jefferson. So I don't want to somehow leave him out of this whole thing. But Adams and Jefferson both understood that the United States could not win a revolutionary war. Remember, the war had begun in April of 1775. The declaration of the uh, resolution for independence is not presented to the Congress until July of 1776. So we're already at war with Great Britain for about a year and a quarter. We needed help. We were a small country. The population of the U.S. in 1776 was approximately 1,700,000 people. Great Britain had a population of around 8 million. The Great Britain had the greatest navy in the world. We understood that we needed help. And where would we get the help? Well, we would get it from the only country that might reasonably want to, you know, kind of pay back uh, Great Britain for uh, sins which it believed, this other country believed, the British had committed, and that was France. So, in a sense, the French government, the French people and the French government and the French king are the real audience, the most important audience, not the only audience, but the most important audience for this Declaration of Independence. As they say, we had already declared independence. This is a way of getting the French to sign on. And eventually, I might add, the French are going to sign on in a very, very important way. About a year or so later, after the Battle of Saratoga, which proved to the French that the Americans were capable of winning battles, that we were actually capable, maybe, just maybe, of winning this war, okay, the French offered us aid, both military aid, economic aid. They sent their navy under Admiral de Gras. They sent their army under Lafayette. We all know that you know, Lafayette, uh, uh, you know, we are here, as we said uh, in 19... Uh, in 1917, at the beginning of the First World War, uh, and that French army was critical in respect to our gaining of independence. At the famous Battle of Yorktown, the last major battle of the war, half of the troops that defeated the British army at Yorktown were French. So, you know, could we have done it without them? Uh, real question. I'm not sure that we could have. 
there's another element to this declaration that I think is kind of interesting. Most of us will remember from our uh, grade school and especially our high school courses that Parliament in Great Britain had passed measure after measure after measure which the Americans felt were unfair. Taxation measures, tariff measures, uh, uh, they were quartering troops, placing troops in our own home because, you know, they didn't have army bases back in that period. There were all kinds of things. The British had closed the port of Boston. The British had suspended the government of Massachusetts. There were all kinds of things that the Parliament had done by, you know, through legislation that the American colonists had objected to. And yet the word Parliament never appears in the Declaration. Only King George is referred to. Only King George. And there's a sense in which we do this because, in a sense, we had already rejected. We already were now saying we no longer have any faith in Parliament. We no longer have any respect for Parliament. We're going to ignore Parliament. But we were still British. We were still flying that British flag, and King George was still our sovereign. And so the last real sense of connection with Great Britain went through King George, and that is why he is going to be targeted again and again. All the sins that Great Britain had committed from the American perspective, we are saying were committed by, by, by King George. And in his declaration, Jefferson makes this point again and again and again. It's almost poetic. You know, he says, he has refused his essential laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and impressive importance. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, and so forth and so on. I mean, I would bore you all. If no, a lot of it is a rejection of King George. Oh, absolutely. But the way in which Jefferson says he has, he has, he ha it has a kind of argumentative force. It has a kind of, uh, it's a beautifully written document. It's a superbly written document. And I might add that one of the reasons why John Adams insisted that Jefferson, not Adams, write the Declaration of Independence is because Adams understood how good, how really, really good a writer Jefferson was. So for all you people out there who think that, you know, writing skills are not important, go back and reread that declaration. <laughs> I, I get a sense there, Gary uh, Ostrower, that you're, you're talking about a lot of the uh, Internet abbreviations that people commonly use in their writings these days, like LOL. Oh, well, not just LOL. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you read your text messaging of many of my students, uh, they don't use capital letters. They do not use uh, uh, commas, uh, periods, other forms of punctuation. Uh, we have to go back, I think, about 200 years in order to reteach people how to, uh, how to use the English language. With that, we've got to go. Alfred University uh, history professor Dr. Gary Ostroy, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me on.